Hey there, this is uh, an academic paper I gave at the EASR conference, uh, Nature, Ecology and Religious Responses to Climate Change in Unibor here um, in August 2024. And uh, I'm just recording this, uh, this paper to go online here. Cool. So... In my education as a historian of religion, there was one room that we were taught not to enter, and that is the room of religion. Uh, there is an epistemological lock on this room. Look, don't touch. But I started working on the ontological tone, new materialism, indigenous knowledge, animist theory, uh, theory ideas that challenge this epistemological condition of the inviolable wall between the emic and the etic. So, uh, I have taken to do something even more, more unheard of, and that is to try to impact the world. I'm trying to popularize an eco-animist perspective on the culture of majority population in my own part of the world. I call this Nordic animism. I use scholarship to draw inspiration from indigenous knowledge in order to generate a position for cultural renewal, self-understanding, and eco-activism that aspires to suggest less ecologically destructive ways of being in the world. I communicate this online, across platforms. At this moment, Nordic animism has perhaps 20, 30,000 followers. Today uh, is sometimes being labeled a movement, and it seems to be having at least a bit of impact. So I have not only entered this forbidden room, but actually become an active, though certainly a minor contributor to the religious landscape of our time. And there are some problems implied in working inside the forbidden, forbidden room. And what I'll be addressing here is just some of these problems, just some examples. And then I'll also talk a bit about the promise of working in the way that I've done and briefly outline my own strategy for a possible future application. Uh, the problems are interesting. And overall, I have actually come to think about these problems as very generative, quite simply, because when you address them, that forces you to create new possibilities for solutions, positions for solutions. So first, I'm going to talk a bit about methodology. So when your objective of approaching a piece of history of religion's material is to produce culture with it, then the criteria for validity changes. And these change to the uh, criteria can bring you out of alignment with scholarly methodology. And that can play out in many ways. Sometimes there isn't a problem at all. At some point, I made a scholarly suggestion for a historical analysis of Orbit kinship culture in pre-Christian Nordic religion. And then I worked with graphic designers to design a contemporary raven flag as a call to kinship between human communities and wider communities of beings. Uh, the background was that eco-activists from majority populations, they have the problem that they're discursively trapped in this modernist episteme of a dystopian present and an apocalyptic future. As opposed to indigenous eco-activists, uh, they lack a, a past to conceptualize their struggle with. Humans need a narration of a past to conceptualize where they want to go. So supplying a symbol charged with the narrative of a past culture of totemic kinship was a way of trying to empower that struggle. Now, methodologically, these two projects are fairly un unproblematically distinct from each other. But it's not always that easy. Uh, often I work in more fluid dialogues uh, where the demarcation of scholarship is less unambiguously marked. For instance, I've engaged some scholarship on the Nordic Ragnarok myth, partly by the Swedish archaeologist Bo Greslund, who think that the myth reflects a global climactic cooling that had catastrophic impact on Iron Age Scandinavia. Uh, and I've also looked at this I merged this with my own millenarian reading of the history of the Wollespa, uh, the Ragnarok poem, as suggested by scholars Gro Steinsland and Preben Meulenkracht. In a sense, it's fairly straight scholarship to suggest that the Wollespa poem is a millenarian mythic reflection of ecological collapse and ruptured traditional culture. But communicating that on YouTube becomes de facto a production of mythology, 
You can't voice all the modifications and perspectives of scholars who, for instance, disagree with Bo Greslon and so on. You can't, and in my, uh, in my view, neither should you. You kind of have to say stuff like, Ragnarok is a cautionary tale about climate change, and that is essentially producing mythology, although you produce it in dialogue with scholarship and source material. So the background uh, to my choice of producing mythology is that I see the accelerating eco-apocalypse partly as a result of failed myth-making. I see myths as stories that lay the groundwork for patterns of relation, all those UN climate reports filled with extremely accurate data and incomprehensible language that nobody reads. Had they been crafted with a mythic consciousness, then they would have been narratives that would have reached people. Communities would have been able to build relation to the possibility of climate apocalypse already 50 years ago. And if I'm right about this, we might not have been in this pickle today. This is part of the reason that all these masses of social scholars or cultural scholars that are working on mythology, it, it just blows my mind that nobody are considering the basic question of how to produce better mythology. But how to do that? You know, it, it's not an easy question. Uh, how do you create a methodology for myth making with integrity? So you can, for instance, distinguish between shite myths and valid myths. And this is a difficult question, but it's not an impossible field. Many thinkers and public intellectuals today are on this. And I'm quite inspired by this guy here, the Aboriginal Australian thinker Tyson Juncker Porter, who uh, works from the concept of right story. Um, how do we arrive at legitimate contemporary myth-making? I'm not going to go into detail with Tyson's suggestions on that. Just I'll just mention that this field of thinking is there. Um, a more commonplace uh, part of the methodology problems is quite simply imprecision. Uh, scholarship typically requires high degree of linguistic precision. And from one perspective, that's like, it's almost what it is to be a scholar, to express oneself with the highest possible degree of precision when, given a current availability of knowledge. So when you are communicating outside these scholarly micro-tribes, you quite simply have to use commonsensical expressions like nature and Nordic animism, rather than saying that part of reality that many in Western modernity have insisted on labeling nature and that current analytical and cultural activist construction of a perspective on diverse and sometimes unrelated historic and geographical context that we might today label Nordic animism. So if you, for instance, listen to my channel, uh, you might hear me say stuff like Nordic animism are ways of building relation to nature in Northern Europe. And this does risk producing nature and Nordic animism as these sort of coherent categories and there may be problems in that but it also means that people understand what you're saying and they see possibilities in it and they start relating to it uh, in fact i'm not sure that the modifications and conceptual accuracy characteristic of scholarship is particularly useful for myth making if tyson is right about his right story here then you have both cultural attractors and you have you need to also uh, potential polyvalence in order to produce proper myth. So I'm not sure that it makes much sense really to seek a full alignment actually between myth making and methodologically consistent language. Though I do sometimes try to patch up the problem a little bit by making videos where I'm sort of making clarifications around the ways that I'm going into dialogue with different parts of history in order to, you know, try to maintain a bit of scholarly integrity. So thinking with Tyson's attractors, that brings romanticism on the table. So working in the general proximity, perhaps, of romanticism does have some problems. One of them, one of the problems is purely uh, social 
It seems to me that it is a social marker of being a scholar to not like Romanticism. And uh, this is sometimes supported by the idea that Romanticism is more prone to produce fascism than Enlightenment rationalism, which I think is historically an evident misconception. But there's also something that needs attention here. Romanticism is an important under undercurrent in current culture, uh, particularly when you're working in positions that are critical of modernity, which I am doing when I suggest an animist cultural transformation. Uh, from the animist, animist position, you could say that Romanticism realizes some of the problems in modernity. That epistemological divide that's pointed out by Philip Descola and many others, what Graham Harvey calls the separatist agenda of modern culture, the lock on that forbidden room. And therefore, while being problematic, Romanticism also has some potential in it. Because if you want to change culture, obviously you need attractors. Um, you can't just make stuff out of whole cloth. So a Romanticist motif like Vikings is an attractor. It has a potential to, to transform culture. But obviously, this is also moving into dangerous territory because Romanticism also does have a problem that it, it tends to locate the romanticized object very far away. Uh, this man here in, in the iconic Big Bang painting of the Romanticist European, um, he's, he's placed at very far removed from this romanticized landscape. He is most definitely not in any kind of real relation with that landscape, and he doesn't want to be. His immaculate suit would get all dirty, and he would have to kill something to survive. <clears throat> Tearing the bowels out of something wouldn't fit so well in this image here of the distant, you know, objectifying patriarchal observation of the aesthetic prettiness of nature, right? So in Nordic animism, um, I'm... I'm very much trying to move things into contemporary spaces. Uh, I'm very consciously sending mixed sing signals, playing with Viking imagery as an attractor, but also deconstructing this notion as a problematic icon of essential whiteness. Uh, and this communication strategy is fundamentally different from scholarly communication. Um, scholarly communication is typically synthetic in the way that it strives away from that organic ambiguity that's characteristic of most human communication. Communication, uh, communicating in organically amb ambiguous ways feels weird as a scholar, but it also feels kind of good in some ways. It, it's, it's natural somehow. But here's the thing. How can you know that your thoughts aren't being abused? And you probably already know the answer to that question. Essentially, you can't. So the rather serious contingency remains that appealing to distant objects such as Viking romanticism risks producing synergies with stuff like national essentialisms. But then the question becomes what we do with that realization. Do we give up trying to impact the world? which I think is the strategy of almost all social cultural scholarship, or do we address the problem? <laughs> you can kind of hear what I think. Um, I could have basically made a whole paper only about the strategies that I've employed uh, in order to uh, avoid producing synergy with eco-fascism. Primarily, the important thing is that insisting on signaling some diversity now and then, then that is not enough. Contemporary right-wingers are extremely versatile when looking for inspiration. They're into Jungianism, psychedelic thinking. You know, you can find strongly Islamophobic positions that don't shy away from drawing inspiration from Muslim mysticism. This shouldn't be a big surprise for anybody, as German National Socialism back in its day drew not insignificantly on Jewish voices and positions. So, signaling diversity will not safeguard uh, your production of content from entering into synergy with people who are that versatile. And this tells me one important thing, and that is that resisting nationalism has to be deep in the matrix of working with 
practice majority traditional knowledge. This makes the endeavor, I think, inherently intersectional. You can't do it without addressing nationalism on the epistemological level, looking at how that brand of self-image is constructed. So in my development of Nordic animism as a cultural position for thinking, I've focused not only on producing a very vocally woke position, uh, a decolonial perspective on majority culture where nationalism is deconstructed as a self-colonization, uh, by the way, a topic with a mind-blowing potential from a, a strictly scholarly position. But I, I try to do, go as deep as I can, uh, drawing inspiration from indigenous thinking in order to open non-nationalist ways of being culturally rooted as a, a European or Euro-descended person. And that has had the amazing effect that my channel is being used today in de-radicalization programs for white nationalism, not white nationalists in a number of places. So my point here is, I mean, you can sit down and you can say socially expected things like romanticism is problematic, but entering into that space that romanticism occupies can actually be a way of producing solutions to that problematic, <laughs> those problematic elements. Cool. But there were a number of other problems that I <laughs> see in uh, in this work, and uh, I'm not going to address them here because it's going to take too long time. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the possibilities. Let's start by forgetting for a moment about saving the world. Uh, and let's move the perspective a little bit out of that forbidden room and limit ourselves to the fact that many seems to believe that indigenous knowledge can play a beneficial role. And this is not an insignificant belief in our age. In the latest UN climate report, the coinage indigenous knowledge was mentioned 750 times. And the recent, no, the ratification of the Montreal, Montreal Kunming Agreement in 2023 allocated an annual $200 billion to biodiversity initiatives that center on indigenous knowledge. A much quoted, totally overquoted, State of the Environment report from Australia 2020 observes that 80% of the world's biodiversity remains on the lands of those only 5% of the world's population that classify as indigenous. These are remarkable numbers. However, that seems to inspire cultural research to give almost zero uh, cultural uh, attention to how we can move the vast majority of uh, global population, those 95% that aren't indigenous, in the direction of indigenous ways of knowing, in spite of the fact that many indigenous voices are actively encouraging us to do that. Um, the thing is that you kind of have to enter that forbidden room a little bit, you know, and there is some epistemological discomfort involved in that. So let's rather observe, describe, and analyze something sort of adjacent to the problem and take the comfortable choice of leaving it to some potential imaginary future if anybody are ever going to use our writing to change anything about the world. Uh, and as we all know, in the case of perhaps more than 95% of everything that social or cultural scholarship scholars produce, it's never going to happen. However, I do think that my work on the Nordic Animism channel shows that we can use scholarship to actually impact the world. There are problems, totally, uh, and they aren't necessarily easily solved, but addressing them has great potential, ethically and academically. Uh, creating mythology does affront this distinction between the observed, the, nat the native, right, and the modernist observing eye that aspires to objectivity. But these distinctions are challenged anyway by much of current scholarship. So uh, in my work on recovering Euro-traditional ecological knowledge, I think I've only scratched the surface. It is an incredibly rich field. So I just want to try to just pitch a bit of a, my current proposal for research project that uh, proposes to work with indigenous knowledge for majority populations in ways that aspires to stay ethically sound, for instance, don't involve in co-opting indigenous knowledge, that works around the epistemological, epistemological lock on that forbidden room in a way that I think might work in current academia, 
And that opens thereby a new and I think globally important ways of applying scholarship of religion. So I'm uh, developing a research project that works directly with changing epistemology, working directly with the ways of knowing, those ways that we know things. And that thereby includes, you say, the epistemological lock on the forbidden room in the very matrix of the study. And in this, I'm inspired by Australian research, some of it Aboriginal Australian, uh, where uh, scholars are looking at the way that knowledge is imminent to landscapes and other embodied elements. <clears throat> For instance, in the so-called songline system that has an astonishing capacity to retain knowledge, probably because it's very closely aligned with some basic functions in human co cognition. These ways of handling knowledge can be found in many contexts around the world, but the Australians just have a particularly advanced uh, culture in this respect, and they're producing scholarship on it today. They're moving around the epistemological lock in different ways. One is that they make co collaborations with um, between scholarship and art. This is a Pankopiety uh, men's painting that was created by taking a group of elders and having them paint on top of, um, they basically paint their cultural knowledge on top of satellite images of the landscape in which that knowledge was uh, uh, layered. And um, so they create a space for uh, epistemological embassy between Western and Aboriginal knowledge. In my view, this is incredibly cutting edge and interesting research. And um, I also actually experienced myself that my work repeatedly seems to resonate, particularly with artists. So a number of art projects have actually sprung from my, my, my channel. Uh, I now have um, uh, contacts in Australian scholarship, and my plan is to start working outside of academic space, possibly in a Scandinavian folk high school context, with those different mnemonic techniques and ways of embodying knowledge in order to approach opening this way of knowing things. things. For instance, memorizing ecological information, cultural knowledge into landscapes. And this can be seen as a very literal epistemological decolonization uh, of knowledge. And uh, yeah, and I'm then going to write some academic research about, about it and uh, hopefully arrive at some sort of guidelines for how to approach traditional ways of knowing in an Ethiopian setting. In principle, in very simple terms, you could take a school book for, in biology for 10-year-olds in Sweden. You know, you take them to the forest and then you teach them the content of this book through these imminent methodology strategies that are already sort of inherent and sometimes extant in our culture. You just expand it with the Australian knowledge. Um, they should perhaps dance knowledge, sing it, memorize it into landscape features. So it's a fairly uh, straightforward academic project that would you know, uh, aspire to achieve the following. You would have layered the knowledge much more strongly in these children than if they, they had just learned it as a detached abstract knowledge process. You would have created emotional attachment between the children and that landscape, land connection. Uh, you now have an indigenous knowledge component, which in a the context of a majority population should be called traditional knowledge and not indigenous. Um, and this could be added to, say, a Swedish biodiversity initiative, also in areas of Sweden, outside of the Sami lands, where there therefore isn't an indigenous population, and therefore, you know, we, we should look for majority populations for traditional knowledge practice. And when you do that, you have an element that also opens the possibility uh, of, uh, for, you know, biodiversity initiatives, including this traditional or indigenous uh, leaning knowledge mode, and that would be a part of basically opening access to those $200 billion annually from the Kunming, Kunming Montreal Agreement. Yeah, so if you know anybody interested in co-funding such a postdoc project, a research project, perhaps even a PhD, 
then uh, drop me an email and uh, let's do something about all this shit. Thanks.